we did some research with uh, African American students and some other students who we were looking at what, what is the black experience at these institutions and how does it affect them. Uh, Professor Greer is a psychologist and she was looking at this particular type of uh, uh, literature, it's called racial microaggressions. And the way that the easiest for, way for me to describe it is like receiving a thousand paper cuts over time. These minuscule, like very small little things that people of color are often exposed to. For example, asking a uh, black person if they know how to cook fried chicken very well. And um, I uh, transferred out of PSTL and went to CLA and got into the MacArthur program through ICGC. And I was funded for two years to work on similar project, but um, Professor Greer's uh, conceptualization of framework that she was using is different from what I was using. Um, I looked at it from a sociological perspective, if you could say. I examined that first summer with the, the ICGC money. Um, the experiences of Somali um, students at historically white universities, and particularly how that affects Muslim students. And there was similar kind of correlation between what I had done with Europe and now this other funding. But we really found out that post 9-11, the experience of Muslim people, particularly the students that were interviewed in Manhattan, had a very difficult time. Um, it was very scary for them to do. And from there, I, um, following some out in South Africa to uh, do a comparative study, again, <laughs> using the same uh, methodology, but comparing the African-American experience to the black American experience, or to the black South African experience. We we'll look at the Facebook discussions, which is fascinating. Um, so what we did for a year is we looked at how Hmong, Latino, and Mexican, and some uh, Mexican, Hmong, and Somali youth uh, discuss uh, about on Facebook, you know, different type of themes that they, that we looked at were uh, issues of like integration, language, um, particularly for uh, Somali, no, actually for all groups you can say that, that language is a big issue in terms of identity formation. Um, from the IHRC project, uh, the Minnesota 2.0 came in archive. And uh, from that summer on, um, the following year, this past summer, I did some research with the Institute for Global Studies. And that project just focused specifically on, on the Muslim experience in Europe. So this whole time I was kind of looking at the US and South Africa, now I'm looking at like Europe. And it didn't necessarily have to do with being at uh, you know historically white universities, it was just trying to conceptualize that whole experience over there and project decided that it would be interesting, instead of reading the Facebook discussions of Somali youth, to actually go out and interview Somali youth. So we uh, talked to Donna Kabachi, and Donna thought it was a brilliant idea, and we were supported with the IHRC the first semester. Um, there was no funding involved, so we just took credits as a way of um, showing our work. And we, the three undergrads um, that are involved, it's called the Sheko Project. And as Sheko means stories in Somali. So um, we're interested, I guess, uh, in uh, doing oral histories with Somali youth and not just looking at specific kind of things like coming to the US or if they experience discrimination or, um, you know, we just want to understand how their lives as individuals here in the US, uh, what has it meant for other undergraduates or for other, three other undergraduates, including me, so that's four. Um, who are on the project, we're all Somali, and Andy Wilhite and Donna Kabachi. And the point of the project is to actually archive all these experiences. So it may, as far as we know, this will be the first archive of Somali youth done by Somali youth for Somali youth. And I think that's very empowering. So um, I guess, uh, you know, you asked me to describe my social justice human rights work. I really didn't see it as a human rights or a social justice kind of thing. I saw it more as, you know, just helping out and making sure that our narrative is documented, be it people of color everywhere globally, that we deserve, you know, the right to document our own narrative. As a person, I guess, uh, previously I was 
I am interested in the struggles of people of color, but working on the Minnesota 2.0 project really influenced uh, my decision to actually continue this type of work. And I'm interested in um, now going to grad school. I'm taking a year off, though. But I'm going to go back to grad school and actually document, continue this documentation of um, Somali youth or Somali people across the world. So, um, and also growing up in the suburbs, you have a lot of questions about who you are and where you come from. So I learned a lot actually interviewing all these other Somalis that I would have never known. Um, um, so it has impacted me in that end. And I got to meet a lot of great people and was offered opportunities that I would have never had out elsewhere. You know. If, you know, the Somali community is going through a lot, just not just here in Minneapolis, but globally, as you know, we are uh, displaced people uh, from our country. But as um, things continue, um, I hope that my work is useful for somebody, especially someone who was in a situation similar to me, who came into, you know, the college experience, kind of still asking, who am I, what am I, do I belong here? Where should I call home? Where's my sense of belonging in this location? But really, you know, ch helping within the academy to change the narrative, the discourse on the Somali youth experience, the discourse on people of color, there is, I feel like my experience um, will definitely help you know, change that paradigm. I Sometimes I look at the literature and just be like, wow, you know, how someone, any person of color who would have read this would have completely, you know, disagreed with what's being written. Um, <laughs>